Jack Canfield. Let's give him a hand. Hey, Jack. How are you, my friend? I'm fine, Steve. Awesome. You? Thank you for coming. I really appreciate you coming. I know you're a busy man, and uh, you have changed many people's lives, and you are coming to Toronto on April 6th. Uh, to help make 100 millionaires for a private investment club. So we're very happy to have you. Thank you very much for coming once again. And I really, 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 really appreciate you. Very welcome. Awesome. Thank you. All right. So um, Jack Canfield, ladies and gentlemen, one more time. Let's do that. All right, Jack. Go, take, it away, take it away from here, please. These people are very excited to be successful, wealthy, uh, become multimillionaires. So go for it. Well, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> tell them, tell them a secret to your success or secret to the, your success principle um, guy uh, and um, start from helping them out how to become successful, wealthy, uh, or whatever you think would be helpful to us for us to make millionaires. Well, I okay, great. Let me just first say that I, I do a little Q and A. But I, I will answer the question. Please, please give an out on top right now. <laughs> anyway, uh, I think the secret to my success was learning a system from a man named W. Clement Stone, who was a self-made multi-millionaire. He was worth $600 million back in 1968 when I went to work for him. And he taught me a system of success. And I think the difference between knowing some information and having a system is a system is something that works every time, no matter what the goal is, so that you can achieve whatever it is you want. And the system that basically taught me was, number one, you have to be very clear about what your purpose is. Most people not clear about their purpose. I believe everyone is born with a life purpose. It's inborn in you that you have a role to play that makes a major contribution to the world. And so, love Stephen Cuffey's quote, he says, you don't want to get to the top of the ladder and realize the ladder was leaning against the wrong wall. So a lot of people set goals from their ego better than goals from the essence of they really are. Once you've identified your purpose, and my purpose is to inspire and empower people to live their highest vision in the context of life and joy. In a, and so basically, I inspire people with stories like the Chicken Soup for the Soul books, and I empower people with tools like I'm teaching you right now. And so after you're clear about your purpose, then the next thing is to get clear what's the vision of your ideal life. If you were living the exact life you want, live in seven areas of your life, which would include financial, career and job, profession, and then relationships, and then fun and creation, like how many free days do you want, how many vacation days do you want, uh, do you want to be studying, you know, improvisational theater to bring more joy into your life, uh, do you want to have a hobby, do you want to have a band, you know, whatever it might be. And then there's the health and fitness category. You know, how much do you want to weigh? What's your ideal cholesterol level? Most of you have probably not decided how much you want to be when you die. That's actually a choice you can make and decide what to happen from to live that long. What kind of medical uh, advice would I need? What would the diet need to be like? You know, what need to be working with uh, exercise gurus, longevity specialists, and so forth. Um, and when I decided I wanted to live to be at least 105 years old, I realized I needed to change some of my, my habits. You know, less alcohol, more exercise, better sleep, uh, less acidic food, more uh, fasts and regular cleanses and so forth. So there's that area of your life. Then there's an area we call personal, which is just the area of what do you want to achieve in life uh, in terms of the thing you want to do because you want to do. And then finally, contribution. So you all are focused on mainly one of these areas, which is building wealth. And when you look at wealth, you have to establish what does wealth mean to you. In other words, I have a wealth of friends, abundance of opportunities, 
people all over the world. I literally could travel around the world for the next five years and never ever have to pay for a room or a meal because I have so many people around the world that love me and would love to have me as their guest. However, one of the big issues is money. What does wealth mean to you? To me, wealth is having $30 million. Because if I had $30 million in asset producing funds, at percent that would produce $1.8 million a year. After taxes, that would give me a million dollars to spend any way I wanted. So I would be free. I would liberate it from having to report anyone else to stuff just for money, et cetera. So that was a wealth goal that I set for myself in the late 30s. And I've not fully achieved yet. I'm a little more than two thirds of the way there. I generate over half a million dollars a year just from passive income. The rest I generate from my book royalties and from my uh, work doing things like I'm doing today with you. So basically, get clear what is that freedom number for you? For some of you, it's just having a million dollars net worth. That's a big shift. But what you'll find is after you reach $300,000 in net worth, and the, there's a hockey stick curve where instead of just a nice slow go like this, it starts to go like that. The, the wealth you build after that is, um, is a lot easier and goes faster. One of the things that critical to know is that most millionaires have made their million real estate. I was just in Thailand a couple of years ago. Well, I was in there in December and a couple of months ago, and I was hired by a guy named Andres Pira. Andres Pira, Pira is worth $2 billion. And uh, 15 years ago, he was homeless on the beach in Thailand. He was a 20-year-old who'd come from Sweden. He wanted to get out of the cold, and he saw some graphs, posters of Thailand with beaches and palm trees. So he Grandfather died and left him $2,000. He bought a ticket to Thailand and ended up on the beach in Phuket. And uh, within a couple of months, he was homeless. He'd spent all his money. He was sleeping on the beach with the, uh, his um, suitcase for a pillow, two towels, uh, one for to sleep on and one like a blanket. And he wrote a friend, texted him and said, would you send me $100? And the guy said, no, I won't send you $100. You weren't that good of a friend. But what I will do, I'll send you the uh, text of the book. The, he sent him uh, my text, the uh, attachment with this, with the ebook of the secret. And he started to read it, and he realized that first of all, he didn't believe it. He thought that he would disprove it, visualizing a cup of coffee. He sat on the beach and closed his eyes and visualized a cup of coffee. And a day later, this guy walks up to him and says, I've seen you sleeping on the beach. I just thought I would buy you a cup of coffee. He said, well, that's kind of weird. Maybe I'll visualize a meal. Started visualizing a meal with a, you know, steak and potatoes and green beans and all that. Two days later, he's walking down the beach, and the guy says, are you Andres Pira? I think we went to school together in Sweden. Let's buy you lunch. Well, he had this meal. He was living on 20 cents a day, which was just kind of ramen as a student see today. Anyway, he started visualizing having a job. And within about a week, he had a job. Uh, leaking people in this timeshare uh, deal, these people getting condo that in apartments in, in Kev. And then he started visualizing being a salesperson. That manifested. And then a week later, he started visualizing being the sales manager. Within a year, he was a sales manager. He realized the people making the money were the people that were mm. building the buildings, were making more money than the people just selling them. So he be decided to become a contractor and started building buildings. Within 15 years, he built five resorts. He has 16 or 19 companies, 250 employees. To, uh, to build. But he basically says, and it's true, that most wealth is made in real estate. Whether you're buying and investing like you guys are learning to do, or you're building, or you're uh, doing flipping, there's a million ways to do it. But the point is, real estate, there's only so much land and so many buildings and building them so fast and normal people every year. So real estate has to always go up over time and accrue over time. So what you're learning there is really important. In order to become wealthy, you have to have a plan. So after you have a vision for your life, you then say, what, what's the plan for how I'm going to get there? 
and that's what I think you all are learning, you know, from Sunil and, and by having mentors and coaches and uh, the, the courses you're in. The, the next thing you have to do is you have to start affirming your goal. So your affirmation will be something like, I'm so happy and grateful that I'm now, uh, you know, have a net worth of a million dollars in real estate. Or I'm so happy and grateful that I'm now netting out $300,000 a year in income uh, for me to spend in just any way I want. So, and then you want to be visualizing it every day, twice a day, first in the morning and night. And I always ask people, how many of you know about visualization? Everybody raises their hand, but I ask you, how many of you have been doing it twice a day for the last week and nobody raises their hand? And visualization is critical because what it does, it trains your subconscious mind to begin thinking about what it is you want. It begins it to, to begin to come up with creative ideas. Uh, the thing it, is it changes your perception. It opens up your your visual, your vision, and your hearing to see, hear things you never felt, you never saw and felt before, and heard before. So right now, you have in the bottom of your brain something called the reticular activating system. It is a filter system in your brain that filters out that which it does not think is important. So right now, if I asked you what you're feeling in your right foot, so you not tell me, but as soon as I say right foot, you can feel your right foot. Now that information from your right foot was streaming up your uh, spine from your foot into your brain, but it was being filtered out by your um, reticular activating system because it was told that's not important, listening to Jack, we're thinking of investing, whatever. So when you visualize your goal as if it's already achieved, you visualize your net worth statement, you visualize your tax return, you visualize the amount of money in your retirement account, you visualize... You know, I always have you know, $10,000 and $100 bills in my safe, another $100,000 in gold. So if you don't have that, you could be visualizing that, you know, in, in, in your safe, in your home. And so you could be visualizing what does wealth mean to you. You visualize your house, the car, your jewelry, your, your furniture, your clothes, etc. And what happens then, your brain is now programmed to open up your reticular activating system to see the things that will help you be successful. For example, when I set my first goal to become a son to make $100,000 a year, it's making $8,000 a year. And so by doing the visualization, I began to have creative ideas. I was in the shower that I never had before. Oh, I have a book. The book makes 25 cents for every time I sell it. If I sell 400,000 pieces of that book, I make $100,000. And then later, my wife and I saw another opportunity that we never would have thought of before, which was if we sell the book, we buy it wholesale and sell it retail, have a little online bookstore, we'd make $3 a book. Now we only have to sell 33,000 books in order to make $100,000. And then I'm in my grandmother's bathroom. I see the Reader's Digest, which had been there forever. It was just sitting there like background. But for the first time, I saw that it said 17 million readers and you know, 8 million readers in 17 languages. And I thought, wow, Million people knew about my book. Certainly, or you know, thirty-three thousand people would buy it. So all of a sudden, this background became the foreground because I saw that this was, you know, I was visualizing in my book. Then I called Reader's Digest and found out what an ad cost. It was too expensive. I wrote an article for Reader's Digest. I started doing things based on that, and pretty soon we were selling books. Uh, started our own uh, bookstore. I hired like, high school kids to come in after. School and, and do that. I, I tripled my fee that year, and I did not make a hundred thousand dollars. I made ninety-two thousand three hundred sixty-five dollars. So eight thousand ninety-two thousand in one year. Visualization works as long as you then get spot ideas, you start seeing things and resources in your environment. You actually act on them. Then what happens is you start to produce greater success. And I set a goal. As a result of that, my wife said, you think it will work for a million dollars? And I said, absolutely, let's try it. So we created a million dollar bill. We drew it, big, big, thick guy, put it on the ceiling of our bedroom. Every time we wake up in the morning, we see the million dollar bill, visualize having a million dollar lifestyle. If I were there in person with you, I'd flash up on a screen, a check that was written to me a couple years later for one million and uh, $133,000. And that represented one Orders royalty payment for the first chicken soup for the soul book. That year we made six million dollars in royalties. With a book that our publisher said you'll be lucky to sell twenty thousand copies. 
So I know this works because I've used it over and over and over. One year, uh, I challenged myself to do a 10 times multiplier on my income. I was making $6 million a year. I thought, how the hell are we going to make $60 million? In three years, we sold chicken soup, sold for $63 million to an investment firm in New York. What I'm telling you, work, but you have to work it. Now, so now you have your purpose clear, you've got a vision of what your life is going to look like. You turn that into measurable goals. How much by when? How much money by what date? How many you know, homes do you own by what date? How many clients do you have by what date? How many people on your mailing list, your Twitter list, your Facebook page, what date? But it has to be very specific. Then you have a plan. What is your plan for getting there? Now you've got an affirmation and you're visualizing. The next step is you have to take action. And the action is required. Now, for many of you, you don't know what actions to take, and that's why you're in a course like you're in right now. It's why you go and watch TED Talks. It's why you read books. It's why you have coaches and mentors. It's why you have you know, classes you go to, mastermind groups that you join, accountability partners that can come with ideas and you honest and so forth. So once you know what to do, you've got to start taking the actions. And what I recommend is work from a to-do list, work from a calendar. In other words, make a list of all the actions you know you're going to have to do and then calendar those actions so you know on April 1st I'm doing this action at 10 in the morning. On April 2nd I'm doing these three actions. And so basically you have now calendared out over the course of, you know, a quarter, a month, a year, a week, whatever, how long that goal you think it's going to take. So it's a five-year goal, so you can have mini goals over the you know, year-long goals, quarterly goals, monthly goals, weekly goals, daily goals. Get it calendar. Always work from your calendar. Otherwise, you're working from what's easiest to do. We tend to do the easy things first, and the things are not necessarily get us where we want to go, uh, especially for things that are hard and are long-term. Um, Brian Tracy wrote a wonderful book called Eat That Frog, which I recommend you read if you haven't read it. And the idea is, as someone said, you have to eat a live frog today, and you know, you've got till midnight to do it, you know, the concept of eating a live frog is pretty gross. Nobody particularly wants to do that. And so you put it off, put it off, put it off, you put it off. The next thing you know, it's 11.55 at night. You're worrying about it all day, obsessing about it all day, and not getting it done. What you want to do is whatever your hardest, most difficult, and yet high payoff activity is, first thing in the morning, get it done. It takes you an hour and it's uncomfortable, such that you momentum and the rest of the day is kind of a downhill slide. It's much easier for you because you've done the hard thing first. We teach something called the rule of five. Rule of five is uh, the idea that your, um, your major goal, whatever that is, and for many of you it would be, you know, they have a million dollars in you know, real estate or a million dollars in net worth, a million dollars liquid assets, whatever you might have. And you want to do five things a day to achieve that goal. Make five calls, you know, uh, read for, you know, five things, uh, talk, you know, to five people about something, spend five hours studying. Um, you know, for us, it would be like, like five pages of a book, uh, call five people to interview us, call five podcasters, write five blogs, whatever it be, every day, five action steps. If you do that, by the end of the year, you've done five times through six five actions. That's over 2,000 actions that you have accomplished to get your goal done. And... Rule of five is very powerful. I, I was consulting with um, uh, Keller Williams, the real estate company. I was meeting with their board in their boardroom in Austin, Texas, after I had just done a day-long workshop for their um, uh, top franchise owners. And one of the things they teach is what's called the 510-15-5 rule, which they teach all their realtors, is that they do five in-person meetings during the day where they would either list a property, or try to list a property, or try to sell a property. They would uh, have 10 phone calls to people to set up those meetings. They would then send out 15 thank you notes, handwritten or send out cards, uh, to thank people for those meetings. And then they would go view five properties that were for sale in their, in their, in their district, their region, so they would know what's in inventory. Anyone who did that making a, a six-figure income 
and many of them were making seven-figure incomes that year. And so, again, you want to have a formula, a system of daily activity that you know produces the results you want. Um, now, all actions don't work. So one of the things you have to do is ask for feedback. So whenever you write something, whenever you have a meeting, you always want to ask people at the end of it, on a scale of one to 10, how would you rate the quality of this meeting? How would you rate the quality of this transaction? How would you rate the quality of this sale? I ask my wife every Sunday night, scale one to 10, how would you rate the quality of our relationship this week? Children, how would you rate the quality of me, the parent this week? Uh, my students, staff, etc. What happens is you get, a, you get feedback. And if they say anything less than a 10, you want to ask the question, what would it take to make it a 10? Because that's where the value is. And most people don't ask for feedback. The reason is they're afraid of what they're going to hear. Most people are afraid of hearing something negative, something uh, they don't want to hear. Like I've gotten as low as a four from my wife. On, on when I ask her for feedback in the week. I'll say, well, what would it take to make it a 10? She'll say, don't interrupt me when I'm telling a joke. Do you think you can tell it better? Uh, she'll say, it's your job to put the grandchildren to bed, mine's to get them up in the morning. I don't care if the NBA playoffs are on. I, I don't want to have to remind you. And one, one day she said, have you ever heard of foreplay? I said, yeah. She said, <laughs> So, so that was not an easy thing to hear, but the point was, uh, there was, let's just say there was improvement that occurred after that. So. But the point is, we can't get better if we don't have feedback, and most people don't solicit feedback for fear of what they're going to hear, because sometimes it is uncomfortable. The thing with feedback to realize also is you want to get feedback from multiple people if you're doing a project, because you know one person may have a bug up their butt about you, one person may just you know be angry, whatever it is. Uh, you want to look for patterns. So when we ask for feedback on a story we're going to include in a book. You know, I want to get anywhere from nines and tens to know that that story is going to inspire, motivate, and transform people. And if one person gives it a zero, it might be the story that reminds them of some negative event in their life. But if ten people give it a zero, and that's feedback you've got to pay attention to. So it's really important to have the feedback. Another big success principle is this idea of find a way to climb under. And that is that most of us are achieving things we've never done before. And you want to work with people who have done it before. And so that's why I have mentors and coaches and, you know, instructors and people that you can work with. Travel the road you want to travel. There's not a person in that room who would go to Africa on a safari without a guide. You don't know where the lions are. You don't know where the rhinoceroses are. You don't know where the hippopotamuses are. You don't know where it's safe to go, where it's safe not to go. So you want to have someone who's been down there and knows what's safe is what works, keeps you alive. And the same is true when you're investing, when you're traveling, when you're getting into new relationships which you've never done before. So make sure that you read the book, study with the people, hire coaches, mentors, et cetera, to work with you, join mastermind groups, et cetera, so that you have the, you know, my, my mentor, W. Coleman Stone, the one I mentioned was worth $600 million. There were two things that made him wealthy. One was OPE and the other was OPM. What he meant by OPE was other people's experiences. He said, don't have to go down the road to find there's a swamp with an alligator there. If someone else has already been down that road, he can teach you what to know. Take advantage of their experience. The second thing is OPM, other people's money. In other words, he would borrow money to invest and, you know, and basically, he might borrow money three percent to invest it in something that would make the extent enter even twenty percent. Sometimes he would borrow money from the person whose company he was buying to buy their company with their own money because he was going to pay them back for money they would have made keeping the company themselves. He would sometimes bought vendor to that company. He would borrow money from the vendors. They were supplying that company because he told them, I can make more money for you than the guy who's doing it. So there's a lot of 
ways to use other people's resources, real estate investment trusts for, that you can get into. But other people's experience is really important. So you want to be in a mastermind, a mentorship relationship, accountability partner, someone that will hold your fi- feet to the fire to do the action steps you know you need to do. Because most of us get scared. Most of us are afraid of rejection. Most of us are afraid of failure. Most of us are lost. Lost of face, loss of money, loss of time, loss of investment, loss of credibility, etc. So you want to be with something that can you know, save you lots of time and effort. Yeah. So I think master group mentorship relationships have been huge. I like still belong to my groups that I work with. And I hire lots of coaches to work with me when I'm taking on new ventures. The next thing is persevere. Well, it's acting. You've got ask, 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 ask. Asking is a critical success skill. And um, you know, asking for support, asking for advice, asking for people to uh, give you information, uh, et cetera. Uh, the big fear everyone has is fear of rejection. And you know what I say about fear of rejection is this. If I were to ask you to have dinner with me tonight, if I were there in person, and you were to say no, a lot of people would go, ooh, Jack got rejected in front of you, or 100 people or more. And, you, and you'd think, I felt bad. But the fact is, my life did not get worse. Before I asked, I had no one to eat dinner with. And after I asked, I had no one to eat dinner with. My life stayed the same. If I ask you to invest in my you know, real estate investment, become a partner with me, and you say no, it didn't get worse. It's the same. If I apply to Harvard and I don't get in, you know, I could have spent my whole life not going to Harvard. I know how to handle that. Life did not get worse. So you got to be willing to ask. And you know, I, I talk about. I have a chapter in my book called "Ask, Ask, 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 Ask." ask. There's 17 asks in the title of that chapter. And I encourage all of you to become what I call assholes. You want to think, buddy. For whatever it is you need. I met a guy who was running a multi-level marketing downline for, um, I think the company was Herbalife, yeah. And he had 1,300 people in his downline. He had 13,000 people in his downline. He had 1,300 leaders. And he said, I invited uh, 130,000 people to join my organization. Uh, 13,000 people did. 1,500 people took the business seriously. 13 people became multimillionaires and made me a multimillionaire. So you have to ask a lot of people to play before you find a yes. You know, we asked 144 publishers to publish Chicken Soup for the Soul before we got a yes. It took us 18 months to find a publisher. Now, if I'd given up after 100, I would not be talking to you today. So you would never have heard of me. I would not be a multimillionaire sitting in my $60 home here in Santa Barbara. So the reality is asking a critical uh, skill you have to build and you have to get rid of the fear of rejection and realize rejection is just part of the path. Failure is just part of the way you get there. A friend of mine wrote a book I recommend you read called, uh, um, uh, God, what's it called? Uh, Go for No. It's called Go for No. And the idea is most people you're asking are thinking for yes. But you get upset when you get a no. And if you get a lot of no's in a row, you tend to give up. So what his book is about is deciding that you are going to have a goal today to get 20 no's. And so every time you get a no, you feel closer to your goal. Wow, I got 10 no's already. I'm halfway to my goal. And you can even thank people for the no. One of my friends wrote a book called The One Minute Salesperson. Uh, you've heard of The One Minute Manager with Ken Branch. He wrote a book with another guy called The One Minute Salesperson. And in the book, uh, the other co-author, whose name I'm forgetting at the moment, uh, Larry Wilson is his name, Larry Wilson. Larry Wilson talked about how he used to sell encyclopedias door to door when he was in college. And he'd get a sale every 25 people, he'd get a yes. And that yes was worth, um, you know, $250 to him. And so every time he'd get a no, He'd say, thank you for the $10. And the person would go, what do you mean, thank you for the $10? He would say, well, I get a yes every 25 people. You're number 14, so you're, I'm 14, 25th of the way to a yes, so that's worth $10 to me. And sometimes they go, you know, that's a weird way of thinking. Come in and talk to me some more. He started selling uh, a encyclopedia every 10 people. 
because he was so positive about it. He never got, he never, you know, got angry at the people that didn't buy, etc. So basically, you want to take this idea that no is simply a, a stepping stone to get to a yes. And then finally, I would say key things is called perseverance. Never, ever give up. You know, a lot of people think that success is something you can do overnight. And now with the internet, that does happen for some people. You create an app, something like Uber or Lyft or b and you know, uh, Square or whatever. You know, you can make a lot of money. Not overnight. It usually takes years to do that. The guy that invented the GoPro camera was basically hip. He wanted to be able to film his surf riding. He used to tape a, 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 a um, camera to his head. And he realized, what if he had a little tiny camera? And that's what he meant, the headband and the GoPro camera was around your head. He's now a billionaire. And he's, you know, only in his late 20s or 30s. Because he took an idea, found a need, and filled it. One of the great ways to become a, a millionaire is find a need out there that nobody's filled. People started delivering food to your home. Uh, Amazon.com. It said, you don't have to go to the bookstore. We'll send the books to you. So the more you can make life easier for people, then the more you get people that want to make what it is you're selling. But the idea is persevere. You know, it takes a while. You're going to have failures. You're going to have setbacks. And they're just part of the process. You know, the old story about it took 10,000 experiments for Thomas Edison to invent the light bulb. And when he was interviewed, they said, wow, you failed 10,000 times. He said, no, I didn't. He said, inventing the light bulb was a 10,000 10, step process. He said, I invented the light bulb. You know, and so the your, your, your steps are going to take as long as they take. For some of you, they'll be faster. But you have more experience. You have more money to invest. Some of you will take a little longer. Some of you will have amazing breakthroughs because you'll meet the right person at the right time. And if you're visualizing and affirming, like I said, people start attracting through the law of attraction people and opportunity to you, money to you, etc. Things will happen like out of the blue. I'll just give you one quick story. When Mark Victor Hansen and I set a goal, to sell one million books in one day. No one had ever done that. The only person that's done it since we set that goal uh, was uh, wrote Harry Potter, K. Rowling. I think it was the fifth book, the sales on Amazon, over a million copies. And so this was a breakthrough goal we wanted to achieve. And so we just set it for the fun of having it something to do that we hadn't done before. It's like, you know, let's climb Mount Everest. No one's done it. So we started visualizing and affirming, you know, we had, we could, up headlines on the New York Times authors sell one billion or one million books in one day, etc. And so it went for 30 days in a row. By the way, there's a little rule called the 30 day rule. When you start visualizing and affirming, you want to visualize and affirm the goal is already achieved for 30 days in a row without missing a day. You forget a day, if you miss a day, you sleep in, you get sick and you didn't do it, whatever. The next day is day one. For some reason the brain gets fired. You don't know why, but it's part of the neuroscience. So Mark and I set this goal. We then go to the, uh, you know, 30 days later, we go to the Booksellers Association. This is where all the people that own bookstores come to their national conference. And all the bookstore owners would come there as the exhibitors to uh, promote their new line. So I'm in the booth talking to my publisher. We're doing book signings. We're talking to booksellers, et cetera. At the end of the day, our publisher would put us in a limo with him and take us back to the hotel where we were staying. Well, that day I was talking to a guy who'd written a book called A Thousand Old Ways to Market Your Book, named John Kramer, and I really enjoyed the conversation. And I said to Peter, the publisher, I'm going to stay. I don't think I should leave yet. I'm going to stay and talk to John. So I stayed and talked to John, which meant I missed the limo ride, which meant I had to go in a bus. The cabs, there were just no taxis. Literally like 5,000 people coming out of the Chicago Convention Center at the same moment. But they have these big buses that go back to the hill back to the high to go back to Marriott. And so I got on the bus for my, my hotel. I sit down next to this woman and she says, you're Jack Canfield. And I started feeling like really cocky. My ego got involved. Like, oh, she recognized me. And she, she saw me doing that. She said, you're wearing a name tag. And I went, oh, okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> ego reduction. And then she says, you're the chicken soup for the soul guy, right? And I said, yeah. She said, what are you and Mark up to these days? Because she knew our books. I said, well, we just set a goal a month ago to sell a million books in one day. She said, I can help you do that. Just as fast as I said, she said, I can help you do that. And I said, how's that? She said, well, I'm the buyer for the W.H. Smith bookstores. I buy all the books. That wow. Wow. 
And we're in, we're in almost every airport in North America. And, you know, what we could do is we could do a series of book signings all in one day. You have many co-authors for your books. Like in, in Canada, Raymond Aaron co-authored Chicken Soup for the Canadian Soul. We have, you know, Marcy Shymoff co-authored Chicken Soup for the Woman's Soul. My sister, Kim Carpenter, co-authored Chicken Soup for the Teenage Soul. She said, we'll put you and Mark and all the different co-authors in different airports on the East Coast. Like... Montreal, like New York, like Philadelphia, like Baltimore, Washington, D.C., Atlanta, Georgia, Miami. And we'll do a book signing from 6 until 8. Then we'll get on plane and fly you over to the middle of America. Chicago, Toronto, St. Louis, Kansas City, Dallas, etc. Do another book signing. We'll fly you to the West Coast and you can do book signings in Seattle, Portland, Los Angeles, San Diego, San Francisco, etc. I bet we could sell a million books in one day. And I said, then she said, we'll need an airline partner, a hotel partner. She did the whole thing. She had a plan just off the top of her head. I said, why would you help us do that? And that's when she called me dumb. She said, look, dummy. We got very we got close very quickly. We had a fun relationship. She said, look, dummy, if I sold a million books in our W. Smith bookstores in one day, you don't think that would make me look like a hero? I went, got it. Now, that's the kind of thing that's still happening over and over over and over when you are visualizing and affirming your goals and taking action on your goals every day, you're sending out a message to the universe that responds back with people that can help you achieve your goal. All right, that's my answer to your first question, Shania. So, Jack, uh, you're, you're coming on April 6th to Toronto. <laughs> uh, you're coming to April 6th for Wolf Mastic uh, event. Um, are we excited or what? Uh, yeah. Um, every time I hear, you, I hear you, I mean, I'm inspired. Uh, I've heard some of the stories before, and it's beautiful how you tell it, and uh, it's really... It's really, really inspiring for all of us. Um, any uh, comments about coming here, how excited you are before we go away today? Well, I, I always like coming to P, you know, Private Investment Club, PIC, because I, I really enjoy you. We've become good friends. I enjoy the, the people that you surround yourself with. And I love the people you attract because they're all people who are committed to taking their next step to being willing to invest their time, their effort, their money, their energy to accomplish the goal. And whenever you get people with a like-minded goal in the same room, as you know from The Secret, when you have the power of intention, um, John Hegelin talked about this, Harvard-trained physicist, that the power of an intention is the square of the number of people holding the same intention at the same time. And so when you get 100 or 200 people in a room, you have, you know, the intention goes up to 10,000 or 20,000 uh, or 40,000 units of force, if you will. And that's really exciting to be around. Uh, I love it because a lot of the people that uh, I, I work with there become friends. Uh, we've done a lot of, you know, follow-up calls with people and pe people have joined our Train the Trainer program and some of those people are actually out there doing trainings and speaking. Because as you know, uh, you know, one of the things that's really powerful about becoming a speaker and a trainer that I always say to everybody, if you're selling one-on-one, -on -one, if I'm enrolling you in something one-on-one, -on -one, I can make one sale. But if I can speak to 100 people and enroll them in something, I might make 20 or 30 sales. So the idea that people can become, and I know you teach people to be speakers and trainers as well. I do as well. So basically, you know, we're empowering people in a lot of ways to become masterful, not just in achieving their own goals, but in helping other people achieve theirs. Zig Ziglar, one of the great motivational speakers of all time, says, if you want to make a lot of money, help other people make a lot of money, and you'll make a lot of money in the process. So basically, uh, that's one of the reasons. And I, I, just, I love Toronto. I love the people. You always treat me really well. <laughs> so I'm looking forward to it. Let's give uh, Jack Angel a hand. <laughs> Thank you. We we'll look forward to seeing you, of course, on April 5th for the Platinum Dinner and Mastermind, and April yes. 6th for the full day. 
uh, with us uh, uh, where um, you're going to be there the whole day, um, breaking bread, having photographs and all that kind of stuff. So we really appreciate you. Once again, you're, you're one of the top uh, people who have influenced my life. Um, and I'm so happy to be able to be sharing stages with you, uh, to be able to bring to Toronto and to introduce you to a lot of people as well. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Jack Canfield, ladies and gentlemen. Jack Canfield. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll see you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.